Um, for, uh, for today, we have um, Wei Ling joining us to present um, his work, uh, Do We Really Need Complicated Model Architectures for Temporal Networks, uh, which is, um, which I believe is also an iClear 2023 oral paper, right? Uh, and um, in terms of the, uh, uh, like, like, uh, like the background for, uh, for Weiling, he is a fourth year PhD candidate at Penn State University. His research focuses on the fundamental problems in graph representation learning, including optimization, generalization, expressive power, and model architecture design. He has published as uh, first authors in top AI conferences such as in Europe's iClear, AI Stats, KDD, and SDM on graph representation learning. Um, uh, definitely a very impressive background. And uh, yeah, so I will hand the mic to you uh, to start the talk now, if you want, Wei yeah. Okay, thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone to my presentation. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our recent work on temporal graph learning. So the topic of this paper is, uh, do we really need complicated model architecture for temporal network? So uh, in this presentation, I will start by uh, introducing our iClear paper. I will first briefly introduce the background settings, then introduce some of our newer architectures, and finally discuss some empirical results. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I, I will also discuss some future directions on this topic. So uh, the ma majority of this work is done actually when I was a summer intern at Meta last year. And this one is uh, under the supervision of my intern manager, Si Zhang. And my friend from UIUC, Jian Kang, also helped me a lot on the paper organizations and the paper writing. So uh, a, temporal a temporal graph is, a, I, I would say, it's a specific type of uh, graph structures where uh, each edge is associated with the time step. So uh, for example, in the figure presented here, we have five nodes from V1 to V5. And we also have six time steps ranging from T1 to T6. Uh, and in the temporal descending order. And our objective is to predict whether two nodes will interact in the current time time T, uh, T0. So based on all the previous available tem temporal interactions from T1 to T6. And this temporal graph learning has many diverse, uh, diverse applications such as a recommender system or a traffic predictions. So, uh, let me introduce the motivation of this work. So a temporal graph learning are uh, commonly relying on the RN and self attention. So for example, the Jody utilized RN to first handle the features uh, of the interesting node and they implement a memory block to reduce the number of RN steps they need to backward propagations. And the TGAT, they directly apply the self attention on the temporal graph and they use the sampling strategy to lower the, uh, the computation complexity. And TG, uh, TGN actually is combined the uh, Jodi and TGAT by first extracting the feature using Jodi, then they use the uh, TGAT applied on the feature extracted by Jodi and to aggregate the, the, the spatial information. So although those kind of R and self-attention methods are quite intuitive to capture both the spatial and temporal information, uh, this, method can, and, uh, this method can also achieve a very good performance. But those methods have certain limitations. So first of all, this method can be conceptually and technically complicated with uh, advanced neural architectures. And it can be very challenging to implement, particularly when, if we want to use some memory blocks. So we have to carefully implement the training process to avoid the information leakage issue uh, if we want to train for multiple epochs. And secondly, uh, if we want to, it's very hard to understand which part of the model truly contributes to the success of the method and whether these components are really indispensable due to the complex structure. So uh, in this paper, we aim at answering the following questions. Are R and self-attention always indispensable for temporal graph learning? And our finding in indicates that they are not. And to support our conclusions, we propose a very simple neural architecture, we call it a graph mixture that's based entirely on the MLP and only one hop neighbor mean pooling. And in practice, uh, our method uh, graph mixture, uh, it can achieve a state-of-the-art state performance 
we are having a very low computation cost and the number of parameters. And we believe the main take home message is uh, we don't really need a complicated neural architecture or complicated method as long as we can choose the good input data, the right input data. But how to select the right input data and what is the right input data? This part requires some empirical studies or even maybe some domain knowledge. Uh, but fortunately, in this paper, we only talk about the empirical study we made. But we are not going to uh, go into any specific domain knowledge on recommender system or traffic prediction. So uh, as shown in this figure here, our method actually consists of three components. We have a node encoder and a link encoder and also a link classifier. And all three components are actually just based on the MLP, MLP uh, function. Okay, the so link encoder is actually designed to summarize all the temporal information for each node. And here we refer the, temp, uh, the temporal link infor information as the link temp steps and also the link features. And to differentiate between different time steps, we use the time encoding functions that can, can convert each time step into a d-dimensional vector. And this function is actually applying a cosine function onto t times omega, where this omega is actually a fixed non-trainable vector. And uh, to demonstrate the effectiveness of our time, uh, time encoding method, uh, we plot the time encoding of various time steps. And here's the x-axis stand for the dimension of each uh, feature dimension. So here we, our time encoding actually has 100 dimensions. And this y-axis represents the values at each dimension. So, uh, so the last figure here shows our time encoding function as has, actually has two properties. The first one is the similar time steps should have a similar, can have a similar time encoding. So for example, if we see the time, uh, the T1 and T2, those two numbers are very close to each other. Then we have a very similar time encoding functions for, for them. And the second property is that uh, the larger the time steps, the later the value in the time encoding is converted to one. So for example, we can compare this T1 and T4. We can see the T4 is uh, significantly larger than the T1. Then the curve is uh, moving to the right, right hand side and also it converts to one a lot later than this T1. Okay. Notice that existing work also leveraging a very similar, similar time encoding function. But what difference is they are using a trainable, trainable version. So here is the, the W and the B in, in most of the existing work, they are using a trainable time encoding function. Uh, so however, using the trainable time encoding function can lead to some instability during the training phase we found. And this is mainly because the gradient scale is actually proportional to the time steps. If we take the derivative with, res with respect to this W. And to demonstrate it, we, we can conduct some experiment to, to determine whether uh, as given two time steps, we can do some experiment to let the model predict whether they can classify if a time step T1 is larger than T2. Uh, by training a linear classifier on the concatenation of the time encoding of T1 and T2. So, and so in the last figure, as the left figure we compare the gradient norm and the left right figure we compare the accuracy. So as so in the left figure, if we are using a trainable time encoding function, the gradient x actually is it, it, uh, gradient exploding. It's gradient is very large, but if we're using the fixed time encoding, the gradient is, is quite small. And if we are using a trainable time encoding function, actually they cannot classify whether, whether this one time step is larger than another one. So the accuracy is around 50%. It's basically a random guessing. But if we're using a fixed time encoding functions, then we can quickly achieve the very high accuracy. Um, can we ask questions in between the yeah, yeah, slides sure, or? Okay. Yeah, sure. so I, I, I cannot question. see the questions here actually. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, like, uh, yeah, uh, I will also like really any questions from the, like from the audience as well. Um, Okay. But uh, just for this plot here, um, do you think there's any benefit to have a trainable time encoder? So it seemed to show that the fixed time encoder seemed to be really good, but do you think there would be any benefit um, to actually have a yeah. trainable parameter? Yeah, if we want to make a trainable, I think uh, at least we cannot use it in a form like this because it, you can see it's just a gradient exploding because the gradient right. is scaling with T. 
we right. need to design some uh, better functions that don't have such kind of issue happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I, I don't know if there we can find one or not. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, uh, meanwhile, we also compare the parameter trajectory of two models during the training phase. And uh, sorry, the larger I, this... I, I, oh. Sorry, could I ask a oh. question also on the time, on the timestamps before yes, yes. the slides? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, so uh, uh, why did you, um, so in the sake of simpleness, um, why did you, um, where, where is the motivation behind encoding the timestamps? Why could we just not map them in a, like a, in a, like a rescale them because um, they may be they may have like integer values. So uh, here you map them with the cosine function to a range between minus one to one. So mm -hmm. why did you choose this specific function? Was it to um, have a more stable? Gra uh, gradient. So yeah, I would like to know the motivation behind choosing this specific function. Oh, I, I think the, the biggest the biggest advantage of using a cosine or sine function is we can directly map these values to a to a fixed range. So for example, if we just remove if we remove the cosine, we just use the t times w times b. If we make it trainable, we still have this kind of issue it, because the gradient is still proportional to the t. Another issue is if we don't, don't do not map do not map it into a fixed range using a cosine or sine. It, it, it's the the time encoding function, the value itself, it, it will grow to very large. So for example, in some time, if the time steps is to 10 to the power of six, then it, the, the input feature is uh, at this grid scale. Then it will make the model predictions very random at that time. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, we also compare the pr uh, parameter trajectory of two models. So actually, the larger this uh, this highlighted area, the the, uh, the larger this fine shape, the more model parameter change during the training. And here's the model parameter. I only I only consider the parameters after the the time encoding, the the time encoding. So if it is trainable time encoding functions, we do not consider the weight parameter inside that trainable time encoding functions. So actually, we can see that. Uh, we noticed that the change of parameters on the training time encoding functions is drastically larger than the, our fixed version. And intuitively, if a large change on the weight parameters, it will could deteriorate the model performance because if the prime, if the, let's say the input is changing too quickly, then our the rest of the our model architecture cannot better adapt to the the quick change of the input. And most interestingly, if we replace the trainable time encoding functions with is our fixed versions, most of the most of the existing methods they show a slightly improvement. So the result on the left hand side of this arrow is using trainable, and the right hand side is using a, a fixed version. Okay, okay let's come back to our uh, neural architectures. So. To summarize the temporal, the temporal link information, we use a one layer MLP model. So to do this, we first encode all the, all the time steps. So for, for, one, for one node, we first sample its wall is one hop neighbors. And we source the one hop neighbors using a temporal descending order. And we pass the time steps into a um, time encoding functions and project it into a one, 100 dimensional vector. And we concatenate this vector with their uh, edge features. After that, we pad it into, uh, we use zero padding to pad it into a, like a fixed length uh, matrix. And we apply, the, uh, put this fixed length matrix into a one layer MLP mixer. And we use mean pooling to the output. So here's the one layer MLP mixer. You see, it's a, it, it, actually it's, it's a MLP, MLP mixer only with a one layer, so one MLP mixer model. So it's like we take the input here and we apply the first, uh, a token token mixer weight in front of this, and we add the activation function and apply another one. Then we apply a second weight after after the this this output, and also another weight. So this is very simple architectures. So a, a initial question is to ask is 
whether we can replace this MLP mixture with some kind of self-attention because existing worlds, they are, they are mainly rely on self-attention instead of this kind of uh, MLP mixture. So you also test this by replacing the MLP mixer in the link encoder with uh, full self-attention or one half self-attention. Uh, also we test it with um, some pooling or mean pooling. So uh, the full self-attention is actually widely used in transformer and the one half self-attention is widely in the, used in graph attention network. Uh, the mean pooling is, uh, is uh, used in graph neural network for neighbor aggregations. And some, some pooling can actually a vector captures captures the size of the set uh, during the aggregation. So as shown in this table, we can observe that using using self attention, actually it will slightly degrade the model performance. So more specifically, we can see that the best performance is actually achieved by using MLP mixture. This is the first row, and the model performance slightly drops if we are using self attention with some pooling. And this is potentially because ML MLP mixer has a lower complexity than the self-attention. So it can generalize better than using self-attention. And the model performance drops significantly if we're using self-attention with mean pooling. And then the next question, question is why using self-attention with mean pooling, it will hurt the model performance. So uh, we found that self-attention with mean pooling has a weaker model performance because it cannot distinguish the time sequence with identical link time steps and identical link features. For example, it cannot distinguish a two sequence. The first sequence is A1, A1, and second sequence is A1, because if we are using mean pooling, I will also conduct a, a small experiment to see that if I use using graph attention network with mean pooling, it's basically random guessing, this blue curve. But if I using a uh, GAT with some pooling or the MLP mixer, it can quickly capture the, the, the uh, whether they are equal and we can get a very high performance, a high accuracy. And the second property is uh, using self-attention with mean pooling cannot capture the length of the temporal sequence. So for example, if I are given a sequence A1 and A2 and another sequence is A3, uh, and uh, the graph attention with the mean pooling cannot, uh, they don't know whether this one is longer than another one. We also conduct a very simple experiment. We can see that the blue curve, the graph attention with the mean pooling, basically is just 50% training accuracy. But if we are using some pooling or MLP mixer, it can quickly reach the 100% training accuracy. So, uh, but we noticed that those, these two properties discussed here is actually very important for us to understand how frequent a two node interact with other nodes. So uh, the reason why how frequent a node interact with other nodes is important is actually related to how we choose the input data comparing to the existing works. Um, just a quick oh. question here on the previous slide. I think this also is very similar to what people study in the, in, uh, in the expressiveness for GNNs. So we know that I think the sum pooling is more expressive in terms of distinguishing like multi-sets. Um, I think it's similar idea here, but I, uh, yes. I just kind of remind Yeah, I think similar that. idea, yes. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah, I have to mention something. So in the, in the expressive power analysis, you really assume the aggregation function should be inject to, 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 to make those kind of like the one, one WR yes. test or KWR test. So this one can be think of a simpler, simpler word. We just do some experiment here to just mm -hmm. verify that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but it's nice to see that empirically and you have specific cases that you can show that, that it, like it does matter the choice of the pooling layer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me, oh, yeah, the, yeah, the next question is, uh, so why, why is the frequency between node interactions with other nodes is important? And this part is actually uh, due to the selection of our input data. So more, more specifically, most of the existing work they are considering temporal graph as a director graph with the only information flowing from the inf information flowing from the source node to the destination node. For example, if in the recommender system, then the information is from the, uh, from the user node to the uh, as node. Maybe. And however, in, the, in our work, we consider a temporal graph as a, an undirected graph. So by doing so, 
if two nodes are frequently connected at the last few time steps, then the most uh, recent one hop neighbors sampled for the two nodes on the undirected temporal graph would be similar. So for example, we, we, have, a, we have a quick experiment here, a quick example here. So that we have two nodes here and the two nodes are connected to each other at T1 and T2. Uh, if, we are using, if we are using an undirected graph, then we know the neighbors of T1 has two nodes and neighbor of T2 also have two nodes. But if we are using a directed graph, then only the neighbor of T1 has two nodes. The neighbor of T2 don't have any, any node. So in, if we can capture the information using the undirected graph, then it will be very good. And intuitively, if two nodes are frequently connected in the last few time steps, and they are very likely to be connected in the recent futures. And such frequency information can be just captured by our undirected graph structures. Okay. okay, to verify this, we conduct an ablation study by comparing the model performance on directed graph and undirected graph. So as shown in this figure, changing, uh, as shown in this table, changing from the, uh, from the undirected graph to the directed graph will hurt the performance. Well, I, I also I want to mention is, so in our experiment, we only use the uh, undirected graph in our method. But for the baseline method, actually they are, they are still using, under, using direct graph. They're still using direct graph. And we also test if, if we're changing the input structure from direct graph to undirected graph. Actually, they didn't really affect their model performance. Maybe that's because they are using some neural architectures such as memory blocks to capture those information or because they are using some sampling strategies that already capture those information. So uh, changing, changing from directed graph to undirected graph they won't affect their, their model performance. So, okay, we also test the effect of neighbor selection on the performance of our method. So we compare using one hop and two hop neighbors with mo most recent neighbors or uniform sample neighbors. And the uniform sample neighbors is widely used in the TGAT. They are using uniform sampling. But in the TGN, they are using, they are using one, hop, one hop most recent neighbors. So interestingly, we found that one half most recent neighbors are more can achieve, one half most recent neighbors can achieve a better performance than either using two half recent neighbors or using one half or two half but using uniform sample neighbors. Yeah, this is also a very important observation. So, so to, to this end, we already finished introducing our link encoder. So to summarize, there are three key points that contribute to our success. The first one is we are using a time, temporal, uh, time encoding functions that are fixed without train, uh, not, not trainable time encoding functions. The second one is we are using a MLP mixer for information aggregations instead of using a uh, self-attention network. And the third one is because we are using undirected graph as input. And, and we use the one hop for most recent neighbors for uh, like, like as the input data. Uh, sorry, can I ask a question here? In this yeah, slide? yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. So, um, in the case of the last FM data set uh, for the uniform sample neighbors uh, selection, we see a very, uh, a very high drop compared to the other data set. Have you figured out why this happens? Uh, oh, you mean in this 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 part? Yeah, yeah, in the last FM, yeah. Oh. Have you? Uh, have you understood why we have such a huge drop compared to the other? Oh, actually, I, I didn't really dig into this part. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no worries. Okay. Yeah, but it's uh, interesting to see that maybe something is wrong with the data set or it's more dense or, yeah. Yeah, maybe. I, I think I, I will take a closer look at this part. Okay, then let's go back to our introductions. So uh, uh, let me introduce the node encoder. The node encoder is, is, is designed to capture the node identity information and node feature information uh, while neighbor mean pooling. And in fact, this can be just think of it as a one hop sign features. So for example, let's, let us define this neighbors, neighbors of VI from T to T0. Then the sign feature is computed by the sign feature of a node, uh, node i at t0 can be computed by aggregating all its one hop neighbors from time t0 minus t to t. 
and just average them together and uh, plus their its, its own features. And for this part, we don't need any width parameters. We directly take the same feature and apply a MLP on it. it it's just uh, good enough. And this T is uh, hyperparameters, and we pick one prime parameters hyperparameters for all the data sets, and it works pretty well. So we don't need to specify one hyperparameter for each data set. And uh, finally, uh, the, the link encoder is actually also applying a two-layer MLP on the concatenation of the output of the node encoder and this link encoder. So in our experiment, we can we compute the average precision score for uh, link precision as our performance evaluations. Here, the, the red text stands for the top one score, while the blue text stands for the second best score. And we also compare two variants of our method. Uh, the first one, the MLP mixer L stands for only using the link encoder and the link classifier. And the MLP mixer N stands for only using the node encoder with the link classifier. So as shown in this table, uh, our method here can outperform all existing methods. And the margin is quite large on actually on the large FM and GD ELT data set. And the reason why the gap is large on these two data sets is mainly because the data statistics of these two data sets. So for example, these two data sets has a larger average time gap and a larger average node degree and a larger maximum time steps. So the reason why the, uh, the average time steps will affect the performance is because the baseline methods are using uh, R and self-attention to pre-process all the history history temporal information, which implicitly assume the temporal information should be smooth and similar and uh, smaller every time gap. Therefore, the baseline method could potentially work better on the data set with a smaller every time gap, but less ideal on the data set with a larger every time gap. For example, here's the, the last FM and the GDLT data set. And also the reason why the every node degree will affect the performance is because existing work either use a memory cell in RN to store the temporal information or using a self-attention mechanism to aggregate the temporal information for multi-hop, which could be less ideal on the disk graph when aggregating too many information into a fixed vector. However, in our method, uh, our method is less relying on this aggregation schema and it has less information to aggregate. Therefore, the performance is slightly better than baseline on those data set. And the third reason, and the reason why the largest, uh, the largest, the maximum time, time steps also affect the performance is because the trainable time encoders, uh, the trainable time encoders are affected by this value, the, the, because it's uh, proportional to this value. And uh, the, if it's too large, then the gradient will become unstable during the training. So to better understand the performance as reported in the previous table, and we also compare the conversion speed and the generalization ability, where the conversion speed is captured by the training accuracy curve uh, in the first row. Well, the generalization capability is captured by the difference between the training curve and the evaluation curve, which is on the second row. So as we can see, our method is in the purple curve. Our method can convert very fast compared to the baseline. And it also enjoys a very small generalization gap compared to existing method. And to gain better understanding on why our method can convert faster and generalize better, we also take a deeper look at the optimization landscape. Interestingly, we see that our method can enjoy the very smooth optimization landscape, while the existing world's landscape are not smooth and it has many spikes. And it's very sharp. So the spikes in the a baseline, the baseline optimization landscape is actually due to the their trainable time encoding functions. And if we if we by changing the trainable time encoding functions to our fixed version, then the baseline method will enjoy the, a lot of smoother optimization landscape. Okay, so okay, I'm going to so basically my, the paper is the introduction is uh, is finished. So I'm going to discuss some interesting future directions. So basically this uh, iClear paper, we are trying to understand the performance of a temporal graph learning 
by running many experiments and doing a lot of aberrant studies. Then another interesting question is whether we can theoretically explain those, those observations mathematically. So for example, we can try to understand the model performance of different temporal graph learning methods from the generalization perspective. So we want to maybe we want to capture the impact of neural architectures or the impact of input data selections on, on the generalization of different temporal graph learning algorithm. And maybe we can use this kind of uh, theoretical analysis to further simplify our, our, our neural architectures. So we have some um, very pre preliminary uh, results on, on this one. So, so, so for example, one way to do this kind of, uh, one way to do this is to try to generalize the statistical learning theory to temporal graph learning, such as we can use some random metal complexity or uniform stability or packet balancing. However, this method has some limitations is they can only capture the impact of model architectures on the generalization abilities, but they cannot really, uh, this one, some, some, something like uh, they can only capture uh, the number of layers in the neural network affecting model performance, or whether using residual connections will affect model performance. But they cannot capture whether the selection of good input data will affect the generalization. But as, as shown in, in our actual paper, we know setting good input data is uh, pretty important. So an, a, an alternative way is to borrow some idea from the deep learning theory by assuming, uh, but we need to assume the, deep, the neural network is over parameterized, whereas the hidden layer is, has go to infinity dimensions. And uh, in the deep learning theory, we also have this term popped up in the convergence analysis that can capture the gradient flow or the dynamic of the network. And in fact, we can see this one, it, it can some, we can understand it as a feature label alignment. For example, this G is, uh, this G is computed by um, taking a random initialized model and compute the gradient on each data. Oh, sorry. Uh, computed on each, each input data. And then we stack them together as the n by d uh, matrix. Then we use the outer product to generate uh, this j times the j transpose into an n by n, n by n matrix. And then we inverse it and apply a two vector on it. So this one can be think of is as how good my, the output of my neural network can be aligned with the input data. So I, we call this a feature label alignment. By using these kind of things, we can capture the generalization ability of a temporal graph with uh, both the uh, model architectures and the feature label alignment. Okay, yeah, yeah, this is, this is also, although doing those kind of silica analysis may, may be to require some assumptions and maybe we need to uh, modify the original temporal graph learning algorithm. But as long as those changes still capture the spirit of the algorithm, and we can use a unified theoretical analysis tool to do it for all the temporal graph learning methods, then it should be fine because those changes will not affect our conclusion. It holds for all the, all the methods. So for example, if, uh, if uh, algorithm, if, for example, if we want to analyze the algorithm for a uh, link, link level task, maybe it, it, and, but the theoretical tool is for node level, maybe we need to make some changes and apply it to the node level but it's totally fine because it's in, in the unified framework. And for this one, uh, we also have actually have some uh, preliminary results on this one. We can see that uh, the theoretical generalization error actually indeed is inverse proportional to the, to the average precision. So the, the larger of the generalization error, and we, we, we are expecting to have uh, the weaker model per average precision score. However, this kind of theoretical analysis also has some drawbacks. Maybe, maybe because, uh, because we can, sometimes we cannot see those kind of strong correlation between the generalization error to the average precision. And this is actually expected because the, the theoretical generalization error is just a worst case error. And uh, our current understanding on the theory is still limited. And how to tighten those, the, those bounds is still open problem in theoretical uh, analysis in deep learning. Okay, so I would like to thank everyone for attending my presentations and please let me know if you have any questions.
Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the nice presentation um, and uh, the interesting discussion. I do have some questions. Um, so one question I have is you haven't discussed the time complexity of your model. Uh, though from the discussion, I don't think it's very high, but uh, do you have some explicit uh, big O notation for that? Oh, uh, in the paper, we don't have uh, this kind of big O notation. We, we directly compare the work clock time. The work, work clock time is pretty fast. Okay. So is it, uh, can it scale to like 100 million edges in a temporal graph, for example, for like very large scale temporal graph data set? Oh, I think. Uh, or do I you need to make some set, modification? Yeah. Oh, I think the biggest data set is. Um, but in our experiment, we directly apply it. So my, 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 I, I do it on my machine. My, my machine is just uh, 64 mm -hmm. gigabytes uh, RAM and only uh, 3090 GPU. It works pretty fine. I didn't need okay. to do any modification. I think it should work. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Uh, and you have the code also available online, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, nice. Um, and uh, another question. So I like the discussion on the theoretical uh, expressiveness. Uh, well, not expressiveness, but like the generalization gap that you were, uh, the, uh, that you were discussing. And I think there's uh, still very limited amount of research on, on, uh, like on the theory for temporal graph learning. Um, yeah, actually, even on the static graph, no people do some kind of analysis. Yeah. Existing analysis, they are just using the, the classical statistical learning. They can only capture the model architecture effect, but cannot capture this kind of effect of input data. And since we know temp in temporal graph, the, the input data is super important. So that's why we right. do this kind of analysis. Right, right, definitely. Uh, and I think one thing that I find is interesting is that you show that the two hop neighbor is actually worse than one hop neighbor. And I was thinking about it and uh, most of the data set that you have evaluated on, which is the, the standard set of data sets for temporal graph learning are yeah. uh, social networks, right? So like, mm -hmm. uh, like Wikipedia, Reddit, these are more like social network, citation network like. So, uh, so it's like sparse and then you have most users have a small number of connections with other users. Um, so I wonder if it could be interesting to test this on a bit more different graph domain, and maybe then you will need the different number of hops to um, to work the best. Yeah. So I thought that could be interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, I totally agree. Something. Yeah, but I didn't try it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, uh, yeah. actually, I think the biggest reason why only, we only need one hop most recent neighbors is because Actually, if we see those data set, all, of, all the data set are, actually they are by graph. It only has a source node and the destination node for mm -hmm. those recommender set, those data set. So right. maybe for those data set, the, 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 the property of those data set is uh, using one hop neighbor is fine. But if we, let's say, if we want to apply it on uh, some kind of other data set, uh, I think definitely using more hop neighbors is very important. But for those, actually for those data set, only one hop neighbor is totally fine. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, it's a data property. Right, right. So I guess like like sometimes uh, so, uh, like sometimes it can be difficult to know how many hops do you actually need or. Uh, yeah, we, that's how I think we need the empirical study. Uh, right. We don't have uh, like a domain knowledge. Huh? And also yeah. you, you see uh, adding the number of layers will help us cap better capture the, the, the local information. But at the same time, you know, the, in the graph neural network, there is a phenomenon that they call it over smoothing. So it's like yeah. the deeper neural network is the worse the performance. So I think there is a trade off. So it's like adding the number of layers, it can help us, us get a better, better maybe training accuracy, but it might not give us a better overall performance. Maybe. Yeah, I think there's a trade off. We need to do some experiment. Uh, I cannot say if we're using full hop, three hop is net. 100% better than using just using one hop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, I do have more questions, but I will uh, give someone else uh, the chance to ask questions if they have any. Yeah, sure. I also have a question. I like your idea a lot. Have you thought about extending it to temporal knowledge graphs or tried it oh. with knowledge graph data sets? Oh, I haven't tried, tried on that. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I think it's interesting there. But if knowledge graph, I think uh, maybe we need to make some modification on the yeah. architecture. Yeah, because the data property is very different from uh, what we use here. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Thanks. And I think you have a uh, hand raised, Rosanna. Do you want to ask the question? Yeah, I actually I have two questions. So I will be honest. I think I got a bit lost when you were describing how you're uh, doing the node representations. Uh, and kind of my question is, can you handle new nodes appearing in past data that you haven't seen at train time? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, if, you, if, if there are new nodes, it has new features. It will directly aggregate the node features. Hmm? Can you repeat that? Uh, if uh, if there are new nodes, then we can directly aggregate the node features. So it won't affect this. And if I the mean, node it, don't have to, uh, if it has neighbors, it will kind of like be affected by the features of the neighbors. But like its initial feature will be like randomly initialized or oh, yeah. Because if if it's a new node, then uh the, this this part is uh, disappeared. But we still has the feature itself. Okay, and how do you get that feature? The IX? Oh, if, the, if the data set has a new feature, then we have a new feature. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. then you're kind of like assuming that you have some, let's say, meta information about the node that you're kind of using to generate the yes, information yeah. of the node. Okay, so you're kind of dependent on that. Okay, and then my second question is um, when you're explaining the limitations of self attention and kind of like those things that cannot distinguish. So I understand that you saw that in practice, but do you have like any explanations for why it cannot distinguish? Well, those two things? Oh, yeah, this, this is how it's the, so let's say the self-attention is uh, like a data dependent. So if the data is the same, then the self-attention will should be the same, right? Yeah, because self-attention is just applying on the data and they compare the data similarity, self-attention mechanism. And yeah, if, if the uh, if the data is the same, then the, the self-attention aggregation weight is the same. And if we use the mean pooling, then these two values will be the same. Okay, I'm I'm not sure I follow, but I will definitely look more into the paper. I, overall, I think it's really, really cool things that you're highlighting and kind of like breaking some assumptions that people maybe were having and using very complex things for these problems. Yeah, because at the beginning, uh, this one is, is actually an intern project. So at the beginning, my manager said that maybe you can develop some transformer. And, uh, but I found those kind of method is very hard to understand. Because when I'm reading those baselines implementation, it, it takes me a month to un fully understand. At first reading the papers, I, I couldn't really get what they are doing in the implementation. So I go to read the code and it, it's really hard for me to understand what they're doing. So I think maybe you can do something opposite. So instead of developing a very advanced neural architecture, maybe you can see whether we can develop a very simple architectures and it just uh, something like this. Okay, uh, can I ask a question also? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, uh, could you explain um, I don't think it was in the slides, how you split the data, because in your paper, there is also a discussion about choosing the K most recent neighbors for each node. Then I'm not understanding yeah. if like, you, like in the train set, you use all the nodes, all the nodes of the input, but you chose the, you split on the edges, but you also choose like, you 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 leave away, you leave outside the the most the initial interactions. How do you do it exactly? Uh, I, what do you mean leave aside the most uh, yeah. recently? Yeah, because you, you had a discussion about uh, the hyperparameter k, where you said that um, you choose the k most recent neighbors for each node. Yes. Yes. So does this mean that you ignore like? initial edges if they're like yeah in the very beginning 
it, it's like uh, if, for example, uh, if we want to compute the, uh, so the, in the temporal graph data set, it's it's like a, it's a uh, it has many links, and each link has a time step, and the data set is splitted by the the time step. So you usually pick the first seventeen percent and training set, and uh, the next fifteen percent as evaluation as a validation, and the rest as a testing. And during the training, we, we directly use, we only use uh, the training set. And during the validations, we 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 test on the the, no, the the links in the validation set. But we can use all the graph information both in the training and the, the as long as the time set is smaller than current time set, it's fine. So as long as uh, any uh, links has a time set that that is uh, older than my time set, then I can use it. Okay. Yeah, and here we only pick the most key recent uh, edges. It, it, it just gives us a uh, good enough performance. Okay. Okay, understand. Thank you. Okay. 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 Um, I also had a uh, general question. Actually, uh, most of these methods, sure. including your methods, which is very interesting, they can achieve very high performance. Do you have any intuition about this? Yeah, I think the data set, the data set on camera graph, it needs, we need more work on the data set. The data set is too easy. Yeah, I, I remember there the work they said, they, they don't really need the training. They can achieve very good performance. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the last year, you were So actually, uh, that's something I, that I want to like part of as well. So actually, me and Pharma are working on a large scale data set uh, kind of paper for temporal graph will include like, like 100 million edges and these so on, like very large temporal graphs. So if you're interested, like like we can send you an email once we have a data set ready, and then you can test your method on the like on the large scale data set and see how well they come uh, like like they would perform um, in yeah, more challenging sure, sure. data sets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll follow up on that. Thanks. Oh, actually, so in, in the theoretical analysis, uh, the follow up directions. We we can we found that based on our theory we can just remove this MLP mixture. We can just replace the MLP mixture with the scalar scalar vector, and it can achieve the almost a similar performance, and okay. it can bring us even better performance. Very nice. Uh, and and I think this also relates to the evaluation metric. So uh, so uh, so we've done some work on like understanding evaluation metric for temporal graph and the way that it's currently. Uh, done for link prediction is also very problematic. So for example, it wouldn't uh, sample the negative edges that are more difficult. So they will sample yeah. like uniformly randomly sample the, the negative edges, which are like super easy for the most part. Um, yes, yes. And you wouldn't test on edges that would reoccur over time and these kind of things. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that's also like more work to do in that direction to understand the mm -hmm. performance. Uh, Okay, hey, uh, are there more questions from the audience? Um, feel free to raise your hand or uh, just unmute yourself. Uh, okay, uh, if, yeah, 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 go ahead, Rosanna. No, I just wanted to say, I actually I have a few questions that I don't want to take everyone's time. Uh, can we also send an email if we want to? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Oh, you can ask here, no, no worry. <laughs> Well, yeah, because uh, just kind of like related to the evaluation. So the way you're evaluating, you're kind of only evaluating for the next time point, And you're considering that you kind of have all the data up to then, right? Like you're not kind of trying to predict for multiple time points in the future. That would be some a different setting, right? Yes, yes, different setting. OK, and because I don't know, like maybe that would change how it behaves and also since you're taking the K most recent time points, um, do you think that maybe the data sets are too simplistic in that way? Like they don't have long enough sequences? Uh, I'm trying to think how is that not a limitation if you're only considering, you know, like a fixed size temporal, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. but I'm not sure. Uh... Yeah, because 
yeah, this is the, the, the data set we have actually. Uh, I, actually, we also, yeah, recently we also tested on the uh, MEG data set. I think that one is the largest one. Mm. Uh, but the performance is also just almost the same. I think mainly because of data set. Data set itself is really, really simple. Yeah, I, I think I we think... need to first work on the data set. <laughs> I, I was thinking it might be interesting to kind of like compare these results with some data set statistics and especially where someone else highlighted you had a bigger difference in some scores when you were kind of like modifying something for one of the data sets and kind of like saying okay what was different there that that thing happened but yeah okay anyway I will I will probably try to think of more questions and write to some thank you okay okay thanks uh, if there are no more questions, so we can wrap up here for today. Uh, let's thank again, uh, Wei for the excellent presentation and the detailed explanation. Uh, I think it's definitely uh, very interesting work. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining everyone and see you next week at the same time for the reading group. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye. Thank see you, everyone. Much.